Welcome to today's presentation. My name is Silkman and in today's presentation I like to have a look at Brendan Dassey, how he went from freedom to incarceration. And as we can see here is a photograph of both Brendan and Stephen at Crivets on November the 5th, 2005. Yet just a few short months later, Brendan was arrested on the 1st of March 2006. He was sentenced to life in prison in April 2007. So how did Brendan go from being a free man to spending the rest of his life in prison? The question I would like to ask in today's presentation is the following. Was Brendan a willing participant to the brutal murder of Teresa Halbach? Or was he a victim of his vulnerabilities in trusting public officials? I would like to focus on two people. Detective Anthony O'Neill and the school bus driver. Both played very important roles in his very first interview with Detective Anthony O'Neill. It's important to have a look at the chronology of events that unfolded. On Monday, October 31st, Teresa Holbach was at the Alvary salvage yard. We don't know exactly when she was there but rough estimates are around about 2.30 to 2.45 p.m. She was there to photograph a minivan for Barb Yonder who's Stephen Avery's sister. After the photo shoot Stephen had paid Teresa and saw her leave the property and according to Stephen Teresa had stayed for around about five minutes. The other event that took place was that the school bus driver by the name of Lisa Buchner let both Blaine and Brendan Dassey off at the end of Avery Road at about 3.45. Blaine and Brendan walked down the gravel driveway towards their home as you can see in this picture here. So the bus led off the boys at the end of Avery Road. The boys then had to walk down the gravel driveway to their home. On Thursday, November the 3rd, Teresa was reported missing by her mother, Karen. And hence we have the commencement of the CASA report. On Saturday, November the 5th, Stephen Avery driving in his Pontiac Grand Dam, Brendan Dussey, as well as other family members, they leave for their family cavern in Crivets. But another very important event occurred on the Saturday, and that was both Pam and Nicole Sturm, they find Teresa's Hallback blue Toyota RAV4 in the Avery salvage yard at about 10.20 in the morning. They found that the doors were locked, the number plates were missing, and that no one had noted any signs of blood either on or in the partially camouflaged vehicle. On Sunday, November 6, a group of detectives and law enforcement officers went to Crivets and what they did was that they seized Steve Avery's Pontiac Grand Am and it was towed away. Now driving that car was Brian Dassey and a passenger happened to be Brendan Dassey and I quote 
I asked Brendan if he would sit and talk with Detective Baldwin and myself in my unmarked squad car. While in my car, I informed Brendan that he was not under arrest and that he was free to leave at any time. Brendan agreed to talk to us. This is a report written by Detective O'Neill. Note, no adult was with Brendan at the time. He was by himself in the car. Now, Anthony O'Neill wrote a report and he asked questions to Brendan and he asked, specifically asked, whether Brendan had seen either Teresa or her vehicle on that particular Monday. Brendan's first response was that he did not see either Teresa or her Toyota SUV. But something occurred during that interview in the car. When Detective O'Neill stepped out of the car, Agent Skalinski provided information to Anthony O'Neill. And that information concerned about the observations of a bus driver. The bus driver, the school bus driver, said that she saw Teresa and her vehicle at about 3.45 p.m. and that apparently Teresa was taking photos. Note, Stephen Avery's blazer was also mentioned. Now, we have a problem here, a serious one, and that is, how could the school bus driver see Teresa and her vehicle on the Avery property but not Brendan. What was happening here? So let's have a look at Special Agent Kim Skolinski and find out exactly how Anthony O'Neill found out about this piece of information. Question When did you exactly learn that the bus driver reported passing that area? At roughly 3.45 on the 31st. You knew that on Saturday, didn't you? No, I did not. When did you learn it? Answer. On Sunday, when Agent Skolinski and I conferred outside the vehicle, uh, when Brendan was being interviewed. So, Anthony O'Neill received this information while they were questioning Brendan. Now this had a dramatic effect because it completely changed how Brendan now had responded to further questioning by the detectives. So Anthony O'Neill started asking Brendan questions regarding the bus driver. So he asked Brendan about, okay, the bus driver saw apparently Teresa and her vehicle. What can you tell us about this? Brendan now admits to seeing Teresa and her vehicle traveling out of the driveway. So this is a complete change from what he initially told the detectives in the car. Again, Brendan was asked about the observations of the bus driver. Brendan again changes his recollections and now states that he now admits to seeing his uncle Stephen Avery and Teresa taking pictures and that Brendan was standing in his home and he saw this from the kitchen sink window. Now those of you who are familiar with the case will immediately recognize that this particular piece of information 
was exactly what Bobby Dassey stated he saw. So now Brendan, on questioning about the observations of the bus driver, completely changed his recollections and he did this twice. But the report really does not give justice to the conversations that took place and it is important to have a look at what occurred. Let me read it. Now remember Detective O'Neill comes back into the car with the knowledge about the bus driver. Have a look at the way the questioning now changes. Detective O'Neill. Okay, it's not too often that somebody standing by your house, by the field taking pictures of the van. You got dropped off from school. How many other people were on that school bus? Brendan. About 15, 16. Detective O'Neill. Plus the school bus driver, right? Brendan. Yeah. Detective O'Neill. And you were dropped off. It's such an event that somebody's, that someone standing in your field taking a picture of that van that you remember that, don't you? The bus driver remembers it. The kids on the school bus remember it. The girl taking pictures. You remember that? Brendan. Well, I wasn't looking at the Detective O'Neill. Huh? I wasn't looking in the field. Detective O'Neill. You got off that bus and started walking towards your house. Brendan. Well, sometimes I'm talking to Blaine. Detective Baldwin. Yeah, you remember that girl taking that picture. You're getting off the bus. It's a beautiful day. It's daylight and everybody sees her. You do too. Don't you remember seeing that girl standing there taking a picture? Brendan. Maybe. I don't know. I uh, don't remember. So you can clearly see that he is very hesitant. Brendan clearly is thinking, well, wait a minute. If the bus driver and 15 or 16 other school children on the bus apparently saw the uh, girl taking pictures, how come I didn't see it? Here comes the defining moment for Brendan that changed everything. I continue. Detective Baldwin, Brendan, come on. Detective O'Neill, you do know, don't you, Brendan? You're not going to disappoint any of us. Think about that girl. Was that girl standing there taking a picture that day? Brendan, maybe. Detective O'Neill, ah, it's either a yes or no. I mean, I'm not putting nothing in your mind. You tell me if you remember that girl standing there taking pictures. Brendan, no response. Detective O'Neill, was she? Huh? Why won't you tell me? Brendan, have a look at his response. I was just trying to think if I seen her. Detective O'Neill, well, did you see her standing there taking a picture? Brendan, yeah. He now has clearly cross the line. Brendan now agrees to something that initially he never saw. All right. Now, it is important to actually have a look at what the bus driver saw from the end of Avery Road. And the bus driver, her name was Lisa. And she stated, I saw a woman taking photographs. I saw a camera. And the question, of course, is, did she in actual fact see Teresa Hallbach on that particular Monday? 
Now, the testimony of Lisa is very, very interesting. Lisa had in fact given two statements to the police. One was on the Saturday. She gave that at the intersection of Q and 147. So she must have told one of the officers at the barricade that she had observed a woman taking pictures. This information was then, of course, relayed by Skalinski to Detective O'Neill. And Detective O'Neill used this information to question Brendan. And remember, Brendan then agreed, yes, he did see someone, a female, taking photographs. And he even mentioned his uncle, Stephen Avery, with Teresa uh, outside his house. Lisa also came back on the Monday and gave another statement to Mark Wiegert. But note, there were some inconsistencies appearing even at that early stage. She couldn't remember whether she had seen the photographer, the woman photographer, on either the Monday, the Tuesday, or the Wednesday. Now remember, this is fairly early on in the piece, so she was unsure even at that stage. She stated that she had seen an unknown female taking pictures around about 3.30. Now remember that uh, the bus driver dropped off the boys at around about 3.40, 3.45 p.m. But she did mention seeing a Grand Prix and a truck. Now, Lisa, of course, was uh, questioned in the Steve Avery trial. And now it is important to have a look at her testimony. It is quite revealing. Question. And you can't tell us, though, to the exactly what day it was you made these observations. No. And can you say for sure whether it was the week of October 31st? No. Could it have been before October 31st? Yes. Could it have been a week before? Yes. Could it have been two weeks before? Yes. I, I don't know. So you don't know exactly when it was you saw this woman taking pictures? No. And do you remember, well, let me ask you this. How close did you get to her? I have no idea how far away it would have been. In summary, Lisa could not recall the day, the week, the distance and location where she saw the woman taking pictures at the Avery salvage yard. Now note, her timeline of approximately 3.45 p.m. did not match at all Stephen Avery's timeline nor Bobby Dassey's of around about 2.45 p.m. That is, seeing Teresa taking pictures of Barb's minivan. This now raises serious credibility issues of the bus driver. Now remember, back when Brendan was being questioned by Detective O'Neill, Detective O'Neill would not have known this. So let's have a look at the bus pickup drop-off point at the end of Avery Road. Let's examine what the bus driver may or may not have seen. Well, Brendan was asked during an interview to draw what he did the moment he got off the school bus. And this is known as Hearing Exhibit 94, part of the self-interview form. 
and you can see the diagram that he drew uh, both him and his brother uh, come off the bus go past the mailboxes and start walking towards their home now we can overlay a Google map image of the same location and this is to show you uh, the geolocation of what Brendan drew and I've placed here Avery Road here is the location of the bus where the bus drops off Brendan and Blaine this is the location of uh, their home and this is the location of the trailer so of Stephen uh, Avery's trailer so the bus driver stops at the end of Avery Road and the boys walk home down the gravel driveway now it's important to establish the location of Barb's minivan and there are plenty of photos and videos showing that Barb's minivan uh, this is the location of the bus um, at the end of Avery Road that you can see where the boys have been dropped off by the bus driver the location of Barb's minivan is right here at the end of the gravel drive and this is showing a point of view from this location with a black arrow showing the view driving towards Barb's minivan this is about the point of view that the bus driver would have had of the minivan down the gravel road now remember she said that she saw a photographer and she saw a camera this is the point of view of a vehicle approaching Barb's minivan using Google Maps we can establish that the distance between the bus and the minivan was about 325 meters quite a considerable distance okay so if we have a look at what Lisa Buchner said during the trial they were trying to establish exactly where she had seen the woman taking the photographs and I'll read this out question and that's okay um, and do you know where the vehicles were that she was taking photographs of answer they were at the end of the driveway question and at the end of the where you enter the Avery property answer the uh, the gravel driveway to the right of of um, Avery Road by the mailboxes so if you read the testimonies it became pretty obvious where Lisa had actually seen the woman photographer it wasn't near Steve Avery's home it was actually next to the mailboxes right at the end of Avery Road and how do we know this if you have a look at the location over here shown in yellow the bus driver stopped at the end of Avery Road to let the boys off and the boys walked down the gravel driveway that means that the location shown in the yellow circle is very likely the location that she had seen the female photographer taking pictures of the vehicles note it was nowhere near where Barb Yonder's minivan was and we know this because even Ken Kratz stated we know that because of Miss Buchner, Lisa Buchner, when she testified in this case, 
that she testified that she saw a woman taking pictures of cars that were for sale. And in fact, we pointed out these two vehicles, the Grand Prix and the Blazer, that Miss Holbuck had earlier or just within the last month or six weeks had taken photographs of. So what is the upshot of all this? It meant that this clearly was not on the Monday, October 31st, 2005. Of course, Brendan wasn't the only boy walking down the gravel driveway. Same with his brother, Blaine. Now note, Blaine was questioned on the Monday, November the 7th. And there are a couple of important points that I need to read out for you. Blaine described this day as a normal school day with nothing out of the ordinary occurring. Blaine stated that when school was over, he and Brendan rode the bus home and they were dropped off sometime between 3.30 and 4 p.m. Blaine said he and Brendan were dropped off at the same spot where they are picked up. Blaine was asked to describe where the bus drop, drops him off and picks him up. And Blaine responded it was where the red black blazer is currently located. Blaine was asked if he recalled seeing anyone on the Avery property when he got off the bus on the afternoon of Monday. Blaine responded, not really. When asked what he meant by not really, Blaine said he did not see anybody. Now note, this is in complete contrast to what his brother said. On the 10th, 31, 2005, the red black blazer and the Monte Carlo were for sale at the end of the driveway. Blaine said he can recall those vehicles being there. So straight away, we have a conflict. Brendan stated after being questioned by Detective O'Neill that yes, he did see the woman photographer and Stephen Avery near Stephen's trailer. But Blaine didn't see anyone. To my surprise, Blaine was actually interviewed on the Saturday, November the 5th. This is one day before Brendan was questioned at Crivets. And look who was part of the questioning. Skolinski. And apparently Blaine and his mother were at the Cedar Ridge restaurant where they had asked him a series of questions. Now note, this is important because they questioned Blaine, who was also dropped off at the bus, from the bus, one day prior to Brendan being questioned or interviewed at Crivets. And apparently there were a lot of fireworks that took place at the restaurant. And let me read this out. And did you guys sit across the table from the agents in the restaurant? Yes. This is Blaine. Did there come a time in that discussion between you and your mum and the agents when the agents sort of got in your face a little bit? Yes. And were they doing what and were they doing to get in your face? What were they doing to get in your face? They were arguing. They were arguing? Yes. They tried to convince you that Stephen Avery was guilty, didn't they? Yes. And they got loud about it at the restaurant? Yes. And then they stomped off and left you there when you wouldn't turn on your uncle, didn't they? Yes. Now remember, this is on the 5th. 
This is as evidence was coming in. So already they were putting pressure on not only Blaine, but also on his brother, Brendan. But there's one clear difference. Blaine admitted to seeing nobody, whereas Brendan stated that he did. This is actually quite revealing. This is the self-interview form that Michael O'Kelly presented to Brendan, and he asked him to fill it out. And it is worth reading. It might take a minute, but it's worth reading. Now look at the question that was being asked. This person received sexual and fatal injuries. How would you explain this? Please write in detail your ideas that would account for this. Start from the beginning and continue. This is what Brendan wrote. Remember, he's 16 at the time. The story is that me and Blaine, my brother, came home from school at 3.45 p.m. about and walked down our driveway and went into the house and Blaine went to get the phone and called his friend Jason to see if he was going trick or treating. And then at 5.30, we went up the road to go with Jason and picked him up. My mum came home when Blaine was walking up the driveway. Blaine was halfway to the mailbox to get picked up when mum came home. Then mum left home at 6 p.m. to go shopping with Scott. I was in my room playing PlayStation 2 and got a call from Blaine's boss and I told him that he was gone trick or treating with a friend. He told me to tell Blaine to call his boss when he got back home at 11.30 p.m. I then went back to my game and played it for an hour or so and got a phone call from Stephen at home that if I wanted to come over to the bonfire and help him with burning tires and branches and wood, van, seat, cabinet, and we used the golf cart to carry the stuff over to the fire. Then Mum and Scott came home from shopping at 8.30 p.m. And then she called Stephen on his cell phone and told him I was to be home at 9.30 to 10. And she asked him if I had a sweater on because it was cold that day. I went home at 9.30 and watched TV for an hour or so and mum told me it was bedtime. So I did so and went to bed and woke up at seven for school. That is the true story. Let me repeat that. That is the true story. Of course, Micah O'Kelly did not buy any of this at all and stated to Brendan that he could not help him if he wrote this particular story, which is rather amazing because if you read what Brendan wrote, it's clear, lucid, very easy to follow. There were no confusion, no complications and note, there was no mention of Teresa, her SUV, or Stephen all together at the minivan. There was nothing. It was a plain, boring story. It represented the truth. So what do I conclude from this? First of all, Brendan had changed his recollections twice based on what Detective O'Neill had informed him about the observations of the school bus driver. This was a massive red flag for the detective. However, the detectives did not check the veracity of Lisa's recollections 
prior to questioning Brendan at Krivitz. They had assumed that she was correct and that Brendan was hiding something from them. This, of course, represented a red flag for the detectives. However, when Lisa was questioned at the Stephen Avery trial, she could not remember the day, the week or location when she had observed the woman taking photographs of the vehicles. And this raised serious credibility issues for Lisa. But she was honest. She could not remember. And it's likely that Lisa had seen Teresa take photographs of vehicles that were actually close to where she usually dropped off the boys. But it was not on that particular Monday. And this presented the state with some serious timing issues, which I'll discuss in a minute. So Blaine, who was walking with Brendan down the gravel driveway, did not see any photographer or vehicle that didn't belong in the driveway. Now note, Blaine's recollections had in actual fact corroborated Brendan's initial answer to Detective O'Neill. Lisa, I saw a camera, could not have seen Teresa Holbach taking photographs of Barb's minivan 320 meters away on that particular Monday. The tragedy of this was that Brendan was highly suggestible and he definitely was unreliable as a witness. Here's the disturbing thing. Did the investigators, including Kratz, know this? Did they use this to their advantage? I'd like to read out what Detective O'Neill thought about Brendan, his perceptions. It was his demeanour that I felt from all the years of training and experience I've had with dealing with people, an inner struggle, a conflict. He was hiding something. It was not going to be a 10 minute interview as to what he saw. There was something more. Ah, uh, his body posture, his body language, just as I'm sitting here with you today in the openness. I mean, his was just totally different. And, you know, from what I've seen in my experience, it was that that would uh, suggest to me that there was something there. So Detective O'Neill had all this doubt that Brendan was hiding something. Now, of course, what were the consequences of Brendan saying yeah to Detective O'Neill? They were drastic because now Brendan had become unknowingly to him, he had become a key witness. So obviously Detective O'Neill would have informed um, the other law enforcement officers about Brendan seeing both the photographer and Stephen Avery and of course we know what happened next Fassbender and Wiegert got involved in the investigation and Brendan underwent five more interrogations and on March the 1st as we know Brendan got arrested all based on confession. So Brendan had inserted himself into the narrative. However, if you read the testimonies and the interviews involving Fassbender and Wiegert and Brendan, you know 
that there were so many inconsistencies in Brendan's uh, so-called testimony that it was essentially useless. However, Fassbender became furious because he knew what Brendan was saying did not add up. And in actual fact, he even said to Brendan, the time periods aren't adding up, bud. And let me read what he said, the second comment. Fassbender, again, uh, whether Blaine saw it or not, the time periods aren't adding up. They're not equaling out. We know when Teresa got there. Brendan nods, yes. Um, and and I know, I guarantee you, Teresa's not standing on the porch when you come home from school. I, ju I, I don't see that. Um, I don't even, yeah, I have a problem with the car sitting out front yet at this time either. That car sitting out front, other people uh, uh, would have seen that car, you know? Something's not adding up here. And you need to tell us the truth. Did this all start right when you came home from school? You need to tell me. You need to be honest with me. I can't tell you. I, I can't tell you these things. I can tell you we don't believe you because there's some things that are wrong. But you've got to tell me the truth. This is, you know, getting serious here now. Okay. Brendan nods, yes. Tell me what happened when you got home. So here's the irony. When Brendan agreed with Detective O'Neill that he had indeed seen Teresa at 3.45 p.m. taking photographs of Barb's minivan with Stephen Avery outside, it completely messed up the times. The time periods, as Fassbender said, aren't adding up. So we have the crazy situation where Br Brendan actually agreed with the bus driver's observation. But however, it didn't agree with anything else. So even though, even though Brendan had changed his statements, it actually caused further issues for the state. Of course, we know what the outcome was for Brendan. He was sentenced to life in prison for horrendous crimes, allegedly so. He was arrested, sentenced to life in prison for first degree murder second degree sexual assault and mutilation of a corpse and his alleged victim was Teresa Holbach. Now there was no forensic evidence at all in regards to Brendan Dassey. This was completely based on testimony alone and we know that Brendan Dassey was not a reliable witness. We know that he changed his uh, responses and answers depending on what information was being fed to him. And the sad part, I believe that the law enforcement officers knew this because they questioned his timing regarding when he had actually seen Teresa and her SUV Barb's minivan and Stephen Avery. Nothing seemed to add up. Brendan was, of course, assessed by uh, Dr. Gordon, who is a psychologist. I'd like to read this out. In summary, the present interview results, test results, and review of collateral data show that Brendan is somewhat intellectually limited, passive, anxious, avoidant, and reserved. If he is presented with leading questions during an interview 
and or presented with interrogative pressure, his personality as shown by interview data, behavior during the police interview, and interview by the present psychologist, research regarding adolescence and suggestibility, and current test data is very susceptible to suggestibility. And this begs the question, why didn't Brendan simply challenge the recollections of the school bus driver when Detective O'Neill was questioning him? How come he wasn't capable of doing what his brother did and said, nope, I saw nobody? And could it have simply been because Brendan, because of his character, because of his nature, he put trust in public officials like law enforcement officers and his school bus driver. And it's interesting if you have a look at this very tragic picture with his mum uh, during the uh, interview on March the 1st, he states, they got to my head. Guys, this is the end of my presentation. I hope you found it uh, interesting and enjoyable. Uh, during the presentation, I've used uh, a variety of uh, documents and I've shown you all the links and you can go there to these links if you want to read a little bit more about the case.